This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode it could be taking you guys back to year in 2015 or 2014 which is the Kurt Russell uh, western, horror western, called Bone Tomahawk. And joining me today for the show, um, I spoke to him for Event Horizon, and I thought, oh, I've got to get him back on the show for, for to talk about this movie, and that is Bo Ranzel from Legion Podcast. Bo, welcome back to Bite Size Cinema. Thank you so much. I was going to speak only using my tracheotomy whistle, <laughs> but uh, no one would understand me. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> not to spoilers everyone there are oh, yeah. whistles in this movie um yeah no i'm excited to be back uh i feel like we have we have set a precedent now where i can be turned to as the kurt russell expert which is both untrue and flattering so yes <laughs> I, i'm excited well this is I, it, for yeah. every for every kurt russell fact i don't know i will certainly make one up that's uh yeah that's not a problem at all because as i said you know when we was talking about Event Horizon, we ended up talking about Kurt Russell and John Carpenter. That's where all, all paths lead to. And I thought, well, let's just get on with a Kurt Russell movie like we, we will do today. But before um, we talk about Bone Tom Hawk, because oh, I'm very excited to talk about that movie. Uh, what have you been up to? Have you been watching anything? Um, I know you actually, you've set up a new podcast, haven't you, with Jamie, Jane, Jay Sammons? What you've been yeah, watching? Uh- yeah. What you're watching, what you're watching with yeah. Jamie and Bo, um, which is a strictly time podcast because both of us are incredibly long winded. Mm. So the idea was like, hey, let's do a podcast where we watch a bunch of movies or what you know, we watch movies anyway. So it's no, <laughs> it's no real prep work to do that show. It's just an excuse for us to sit around and talk about it, uh, talk about the stuff we've been watching, and you know, and then it immediately turns into a tangent about like her grandmother and a box of puppies, and <laughs> it's nonsense. But um, yeah, so yeah, I'm con- you know for various reasons, whether it's shows or whatever, uh, I am uh, I'm constantly watching uh, new films, and yeah, I you know I'll tell you what I watched just last night. Yeah. Um, which and it was ironically it was a date movie, but I watched uh, a Monster Calls that J. A. Bayona uh, film with Liam Neeson as the giant tree monster, and uh, uh, starts yeah. Felicity Jones as a woman dying of cancer. Okay, I haven't seen that movie, but I'm familiar with it. Is that where uh, Liam Neeson does the voice for that? He does. Yeah, and it is. Uh, it's terribly sad. Um, but it's a very good movie. Like I, I, I think I'm just kind of in the bag for Jay Bayona. Uh, I really enjoyed The Impossible, that movie he did with Naomi Watts about the tsunami. Oh man, that's a tearjerker. I'm not gonna lie he, to you. I'm, I think I had to get my tissues out for that one. <laughs> oh I'm my telling God. you, this guy is just. I, 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 was, I was talking to my friend last night about that. I was like, I think this guy is either, you know, really uh, savors human emotion and being able to draw it out of people. Or he's just got a mean streak a mile long. And he's like, I'm going to make movies that just make everyone feel like garbage. Oh. <laughs> but it, it was very good. I, I saw that um, and and would highly recommend that for sure. And, and um, you know, I'm about to do a rewatch of Ted Lasso because the new season's about to start. And I'm just forever in the bag for Ted Lasso. All right. Uh, one of the best shows ever, ever made as far as I'm concerned. I was going to go back to Liam Neeson. So was he actually doing a movie where he wasn't like, uh, like trying to rescue someone? Because he ever, ever since he did Taken, it's just like he's just become this action hero, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that was the weird thing is in the movie the monsters like, listen, boy, I've got a very particular set of skills. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. What? I don't know why I'm even attempting this accent in your presence. This is just an insult. I can't do a Liam Neeson accent, but whenever I've got Dan Bone on here, it'll shout out to Dan. Uh, he does an incredible one. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it, oh, I, I, anytime I'm forced to, it's, interestingly, in that movie, A Monster Called Sigourney Weaver does a a pretty good English accent. Mm. Um, 
because she doesn't overplay it. It's very subtle, and I like that. It, it sounds like very, very uh, successful sort of London English, you know? Yeah, it's funny when uh, the, uh, the Americans do, do an English accent. It's a bit like when we try to do it as well, you know, because obviously there's different types of American accent, isn't there? Obviously you've got the Deep South. Um, and then over here in the UK or in England, we've got like a West Country accent, which you'll probably notice again with Dan. And then you've got Duncan up in Scotland with his accent, and it's all different tones. And God knows where you think my my accent is from. I've been to, uh, caught sights before I sound like Vinnie Jones. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. You sound like a more like uh, eloquent Vinnie eloquent, Jones. Eloquent, yeah, that's, that's what he said. He said you sound like a more of an eloquent Vinnie Jones, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm Lock, with it. Lock, stock, and two if smoking you, if, barrels. If you, ever, <laughs> if you ever change your, like, nom the podcast name, you can just go with the more the more eloquent Vinny Jones. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take that. That's not a problem at all. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, talk about films. The film I watched, and I was going to bring this up with Gary Hill because I know he posted that he watched it. Was uh, Corella, the Corella Deville? Uh, it's like a pre. How- hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm incredibly interested in. Like, on paper, I really like Emma Stone, but mm. also the idea of doing a prequel to 101 Dalmatians, where the hero is a puppy killing monster, blows my mind. Yeah. Um. Without spoiling it, it was a film that I. I you, you hear this many times where fans probably nest probably said we don't really want a prequel, but when I watched it, I thought actually this is the prequel I wanted to watch because I thought this is an interesting story and I like the way that you find out what she, Corella de Fils has actually got some calls in what she does. Um, so yeah, that's all I'll say about that. But it, it's executed really well. It's like um, The Devil Wears Prada um, meets 101 Dalmatians. And the two crooks in that film, I I should have written their names down, but um, they were just great. They just, you know... <laughs> <laughs> they almost stole the show. Oh right! Yeah, 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 yeah. I, the two I, actors, yeah, I don't yeah. remember the characters' names, but um, right. I, I forgot that her henchman. Of course, in the movie, they would be like, "Well, here's how she met her henchman." Yeah, so that's right. So you get to see how they form, and they're like the comic relief, which is often in these movies. It's usually those characters that almost steal the show. Show, but they yeah. they complement it. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I had a whole ton of fun. I didn't. I enjoyed it more than I should have done. But uh, yeah, that was that was good. So I, I definitely recommend that to have a look at. Were you able to go to an actual theater to see it, or was this a, a home viewing? No, we we watched it from home. We 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 mm. spent a couple of bucks. We rented it. Um, so we we sat on the sofa, uh, got some popcorn, had some beers, and we just pretended that we was at the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've, been, I, I've been lucky in it like they've opened it back up here in the states and especially where i am in the south they're a lot more laissez-faire about you know dying from a virus oh, yeah. so uh they opened the theaters back up pretty early um and uh but you know now that i'm all vaxxed up i don't give a shit i'll go anywhere i'll lick poles and all kinds of stuff yeah. so, uh, <laughs> I'm not scared. <laughs> Breathe in my face. I, I want it. <laughs> yeah, breathe all over me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, in that time, I got to see uh, Quiet Place 2 on the big screen. Oh, wow. Good. I really want to see that. Yeah. I've heard good things about um, it. I, I, I'm a little neutral on the first one. I think the first one has some, some plot holes that are hard for me to get over. Right. Uh, the second one I enjoyed a lot more, just kind of settling in and being like, okay, these are kind of B movies. They're really well done B movies, but that's what they are. And yeah. and I think I enjoyed a Quiet Place too. Once I kind of you know internalized that, um, and then I saw the new Edgar Wright documentary about the Sparks Brothers, uh, which was terrific. Right. So, okay. Yeah, Quiet Place too. It kind of reminded me. It was in the territory of M Night Shyamalan for me. Seen you know that type of movie is it is it is it the fact that Shannon's been about for a long time now that people sort of want to be a little bit like Shannon or is that too much of a broad statement to make? On that? <laughs> no, I I don't think that's wrong. I mean, John Krasinski, like in interviews all over the place, he's like, I don't know anything about horror movies. I don't know how to make them. Yeah. So I'm sure that you know he he pulled pretty liberally from those sources. And there's 
you know, it's definitely got that M. Night Shyamalan mm. kind of hook to it. Uh, that sort of high concept hook to it. Um, I'll tell you, the biggest problem I have with A Quiet Place is the moment where they go to the waterfall. Oh, and they're see, like, yeah, hey, yeah. we don't even have to... Yeah, we can just talk normal here. Yeah, we can just go about our lives. <laughs> waterfall. Yeah. And you're like, why aren't you living right next door to the waterfall then? Mm, that's it. Yeah. It's, uh... And, you know, it's the old, like, well, why don't they just build the airplane out of the black box? You know, that kind of dumb joke. But yeah. I, it really does bother me. Like, why are you why are you living anywhere but the waterfall? Because Little... then you can actually speak to each other, you mm. know? Anyway. Yeah, no, we do. I think we probably we probably see things like that more being podcasters as well, because we uh, I've heard this many a time from y- y- probably yourself and other podcasters. When you review these movies, you start to see stuff like that. Yeah, you know, a second, you know, you pick up on those things. But yeah, um, but no, I look forward to checking out number two. If someone said to me uh, number t- number one was like Alien and number two was like Alien, so they just sort of stepped it up a little notch. So. Uh, for sure it's got some out. great kind of set piece stuff yeah 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 quiet place to totally fun popcorn horror movie yeah absolutely all right bro. so shall we go to the old wild west you know get our spurs on, yes. jump on the old horses Civilized towns, you look a man direct in the face when you talk to him. This isn't comfortable. Well, it's not supposed to be. Here's a uh, situation. Serious. Mrs. O'Dwyer was abducted. She is my everything, and those savages have got her. God knows what they're doing to her, and every second that we delay. You know who did this? I don't have a name. How many of them do you think there are? It won't matter. You have no chance against any number of them. I'm, I'm coming with you. No, no. I need you here. And this is what a backup's for, to help an emergency, not stay back. I'm coming. We're making a five-day journey in three days, riding along and sleeping the bare minimum. I don't know what's west of here. No cattle trail or anything else goes in that direction. If our horses die before we get there, or we go into hostile territory, weak and foggy with exhaustion, we won't rescue anybody. Don't be scared. I am a friend. You aren't. Damn you! You had no cause. If you want to question my morals, do it later. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive. Welcome back, guys. So, the synopsis of this film is In the dying days of the Old West, an elderly sheriff and his posse set out to rescue the town's doctor from a cannibalistic, from cannibalistic cave dwellers. It's got a 132 minute runtime, it's a drama, horror, western, and it was directed by uh, S. Craig Zella, uh, who's also directed uh, Brawl in Cell Block 99 and Dragged Across Concrete. So, Bo, Bone Tomahawk, when you tell me about this movie. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Bone Tomahawk is a great movie for a couple of reasons. Mm-hmm. One, 
It is a Western in the spirit of something like The Searchers. Yeah. Where you're like, okay, let's get a bunch of characters that are a little disparate and there's some friction between them. And then let's set them out in search of their their task which is rescuing this woman from the savages you know yeah uh a, a pretty standard western plot all things being equal like that that is a movie that has been made a number of times um but you put uh kurt russell in it as the sheriff yeah and richard jenkins as his elderly and uh kind of comic relief deputy mm-hmm. and then matthew fox and maybe my favorite matthew fox yeah. performance mm-hmm. Uh, where he is just this stone cold killer of of Indians, mm-hmm. and um, and then set them off on on this journey with you know, and of course Patrick Wilson as as the the dude who is all busted up and is trying to save his wife. Yeah, and all of those characters are really unique and interesting in their own ways. Um, they're like we get some glimpses of their family life, and, and like you you establish you know Patrick Wilson is clearly in love with his wife and has written this <laughs> letter to her in a scene I really like where she's gone and he reads this love letter he sent her out loud and he's like, is it a poem? You know, I don't, I don't know what she's talking about. It's, it's very like sweet, emotional yeah. uh, letter. It, it's really wonderful. I, I, I like that scene a lot. Uh, and then like conversely, you have this, you know, a scene with Kurt Russell and his wife where she's like, this is a terrible idea. Don't go out in the plains. I don't, you're going to get hurt, you know, going after uh, the these things that even our, our resident Native American in town is like, look, I know you guys probably think that me and these things are the same thing, but that ain't, that ain't right. These things are monsters. Yeah, cannibalistic um, troglodytes, aren't they? Which is... Kind of plausible. I had a quick look at the troglodytes as quite cave dwellers from prehistoric times. So, um, delving into my mystery vault podcast here. <laughs> but yeah. Could, yeah. Could, <laughs> could it be that the things like that are still out there? Possibly. It kind of goes into the realms of Bigfoot, but I won't go into that too much. But um, the thing I like about this film is it just feels tangible. Uh, not tangible. Um, it kind of like plausible. Um, sort of the, there's like a realistic plot here like you said it's the searches it's something we've seen before um, then what I really loved about this film because I think that westerns can be hit and miss sometimes in the genre as much as it, it's the same as the pirate movies pirate movies in cinema can either be hit or miss and I think westerns can be the same we've had some really good ones I'm a big fan of um, uh, Young Guns from the 80s um, then we had the Clint Eastwood, Sergio Leone movies and Unforgiven in recent times. Um, I mean, Tombstone, Tombstone. with Kurt Russell himself, one yeah. of the great westerns of all time. But then what you do with this is you, you then add horror into the mix. And I'm thinking, wow, what a great idea. And it's executed in a way that's done so well. And not to forget, this is a, this is a very low budget film as well. Um, for $1.8 million, and you've got a fantastic cast, as you've just mentioned, with Kurt Russell, um, to be on board with this movie. Also, what, what I picked up on here is, um, I only noticed it with this recent film, was this feels like an isolation movie as well. It feels like the... Yeah. It is, this is the only place in the world with 260 people. Was it Bright Town? I think it's called the old town of Bright Town. Yeah, yeah, uh, or some, yeah, something like that. Yeah, where they're gen- one of the big things in the movie is like, well, we got to kill all of these <laughs> these things so they yeah. don't come back. They know where this town is. And um, you know, a little shout out to um, uh, Gav Chucky Still from Podcast on Haunted Hill. He's a big fan of the isolation movies and horrors, and he's mentioned this a few a lot of times on his show. And he said that how well when you put isolations into a horror movie, they tend to hit big. And prime example of that is Predator. Um, and also, um, obviously, the thing. God, my how many times I've mentioned that on this show? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you start putting those elements in. Small, small wonder, given your name. But go on. yeah, exactly. Yeah, get back. Yeah, fuck you two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, elements I love, and it just. I, and then obviously you've got the characters, 
Um, like you said, you've got the uh, good-looking cowboy, I would say, that you'd have in a Western. But then each character in this movie also has their flaws. So you've got, um, is it Chicory, who's, who wants to try and do good, but God bless him, he does his best. He's kind of in the shadow of Kurt Russell, isn't he? Kurt Russell well, is... I mean... <laughs> yeah, how could you not be? Like, no matter, yeah. you could be oh, man. way lo- way more capable and still <laughs> in the shadow of Kurt Russell. Um, Kurt Russell is, I think he's that guy who's got ways of doing things, but he's he's now entering a world where it's changing a little bit. So he's obviously come from the old Wild West because this is eighteen ninety. I think it, I think we just had the Civil War, um, and then you've got. Matthew Fox, yeah, I totally agree with you. That's probably one of the best roles I've seen him in. He just works so well in this film. Um, he's like the sort of dandy, very well dressed gentleman, but then he tells tells it how it is, doesn't he? Just that this is realistically, I'm going to tell you and give you an honest answer here. <laughs> yeah, he's unabashedly kind of a racist in this movie. Yeah, and Chicory call, calls him out on it, and you know. Uh, Richard Jenkins, who is always amazing and, and amazing in this movie too, has that great moment where he's talking to him about like, you know, how how many how many have you killed? Like, what? I don't know that I could kill because he, he he says, "Oh, I don't remember," you know, but uh, but they weren't all Braves, you know. Mm-hmm. And he says, uh, a, "A a woman Indian can use a bow or a spear, and so can their kids." Yeah, and and you know from that description, like, oh, he has killed women and children before. And and Richard Jenkins is real taken aback, and you and you also see that moment with the uh, the Mexicans that show up at the camp when yeah. he reacts incredibly violently, like he is this super xenophobic, not even xenophobic, because uh, Native Americans were there before him. He's just you know just a racist. Yeah, that if you're if you're not a white dude, there is a good chance he will shoot you. Mm-hmm. And. And and they question him and his motives and all, and that kind of thing. But the movie does a nice job of creating a situation where you're like, well, was he entirely wrong in that situation? Maybe not. You know, yeah. Uh, maybe this situation did call for violence, but we'll never know. You know. But, but what I like about that scene as well um, is that Kurt Russell has his methods as well. But then he jumps in, doesn't he, with Matthew Fox, and he says to him, "You had no cause." So. It's really nice. How, it's good how that plays out, where Kurt Russell says, "Well, I've got methods, but then I've got to back it up with a reason." And then obviously Matthew Fox is. It's, it's good how the two characters play off with each other. You know, they're in the Wild West, but they've still got their reasons for how they deal with things, which I think plays out really well. Yeah, there's that great line where after the the situation with uh, the Mexicans showing up at camp at night, and you know saying that they mean no harm and Matthew Fox mm. just burns them down. And uh, he's Matthew Fox, av- after they get done arguing about it, he says, you know, I'm going to bed. We can question my morals in the morning. And Kurt Russell says, nothing to question. Yeah. That's it. uh, it's, you know, it like, but again, all of these characters have that moment mm. where despite being kind of despicable, Matthew Fox also has this sort of hero moment hmm. when he goes, uh, even though it, it begins with like, "Oh, I, I, I'm too vain to live as a cripple." Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, he's yeah, and it, it, like you said, I think I think all of this is is done a great service by the fact that even the violence in this movie is super grounded and realistic. Yeah, it's and that's what I like about this. It's just I can't compliment it enough. Each time I watch it, I think it's like you're watching a stage play, which rolls out really well when you've got the characters. But then you've also got this the cannibalistic troglodytes that are just in the shadows. And when you watch this, when I watch this film for the first time, a little bit um, maybe some there will be spoilers here, but you just don't know if they're at this point going to jump out from the shadows. Do you know, and it's almost like again, I've quoted this before, but it's like Spielberg's Jaws. When is that shark going to jump out in the water? And I just like that. But then you've got all this other, you, your mind's in two places. One minute it's thinking, oh, is a horror element going to come in? And then you're back to an old western, like you said, the searchers, where you've just got a bunch of guys looking for somebody, and it just rolls out like a western, and it's all boom. All of a sudden, the horror elements sort of come in, do you know. And I think that's very clever. I think it's just clever how the two play off. 
Oh, for sure. Yeah, mm. there the the character dynamics mm. and the the script is very good because yeah. it is not only steeped in like the dialect of the time, which I really love. I love a western where you know you have moments where Kurt Russell is like, you know, you you need to remove yourself. Yeah, that's I it, expect yeah. you to extricate yourself from this situation. You know that kind of overly formal language that was prevalent uh, at the time, apparently. I love it. I, I can't get enough of it. it, it was I'll, a take, I'll take Old West slang all day. I couldn't see anybody else with Kurt Russell play this role either. You know, it's like, um, he says to, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Patrick Wilson, which plays the character of Arthur. He says, we're going to go and rescue your wife and you're coming with me because you've got no choice. You know, you just think, yeah. right, okay, that's it. You know, he's got a, you know, I know you've got a broken leg, mate, but that's it, we're going. <laughs> the, the, honestly, the best conversation in the movie is the one between Kurt Russell and Richard Jenkins about the reading in the tub. Oh, yes. It is, oh. it is so endearing, <laughs> and you understand their relationship. Where Kurt Russell is just like, well, then get one of those music stands and and keep a towel near the uh, near the tub so you can wipe off your fingers before you turn a page. And Richard Jenkins delight at that. Yeah, of like, oh, but smart Mister Bruder never would have thought of that, you know, and and turning it into a compliment for this dear friend. But you also like they don't really talk about it a ton in the movie. But it's sort of the last moment between those characters mm. where you sort of fully understand what their relationship was. And and in my mind, at least, that like after the death of Chicory's wife, that Kurt Russell essentially took him under his wing and was like, oh, I'm going to take care of you. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's uh, his introduction too. is uh, Richard Jenkins. I mean, his introduction when he comes in and is like that has the most gruesome coffee I ever smelled it's like, <laughs> soup oh well then I guess it's it's right in the main then man <laughs> you know it's just it's just kind of this lovable idiot but also so like kind and good hearted and in that moment uh, you know again these are big spoilers but at the end of the film when Kurt Russell is clearly going to die and has the moment with Chicory Richard Jenkins mm-hmm. where he says you say goodbye to my wife and I'll say hello to yours. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, oh, it's like, it's genuinely kind of heartbreaking. And, and also, like I said, you kind of understand what their relationship was in that moment that they're, they're not just good friends. They're like, they're kind of family. And, uh, yeah. It, and, but of course, Kurt Russell has the most heroic of deaths. He is just amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've never seen that where someone's is it, torso's been cut open and then they've put a, a flask, which has just come off a fire into it, you know, and as gruesome as that is, it's just as badass as Kurt Russell that's putting it off and he's still there, alive, thinking, I'm going to yeah. take you down in the blaze of glory because you have got that, what, hap- what they say in the Westerns, isn't it, with an old cowboy... He's got. It's almost like a Spartan rule, isn't it? With the three hundred, we will go down in a glorious death. As much as a old cowboy is going to say, "Well, this is it. I'm going to take you down." And Kurt Russell doing that is just badass, you know, with his repeater rifle. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the most like iconic Western moment of yeah. of your hero who is clearly not going to make it, mm. making one final sacrifice. Uh, and all right, so let's. Uh, I know that it's it's putting cart before the horse, but since we're talking about that moment from mm, Kurt Russell, it's fine, yeah. some of the couple of beats in this whole like you know I have been <laughs> I've had my uh, red hot flask jabbed into my open gullet yeah. as well as being shot a couple of times when he uh, finally you know kind of gets the better of uh the the main troglodyte you know like cuts off his foot and ends up getting back to his feet and they end up uh killing him uh <laughs> wax his head right off he stands up it like clearly has he's been shot twice his yeah. gut's been opened up like he's in bad shape but he stands up in that moment of like goddamn right 
and then collapses immediately. Yeah. It's like I'm one last time I'm going to I'm going to stand up because I have bested you, but he's done for, you know, and that collapse is it's so good. It's such a great like Kurt Russell moment of yeah. the peak of success and I've done it and oh but I'm not going to make it out of here and uh, and as an actor, there's a beat where after he says his goodbyes to everybody and Chicory leaves him alone, that he has this quick kind of like almost a sob of like, this is it. Everybody's gone. Now I'm going to die alone. And oh, it's so good. God. Oh, man. Kurt Russell is so good it, it just pulls movie. it off so well. And that, that going back to that conversation where he says, you know, I'll say hello to my wife and um, I'll say hello to yours. Is that Kurt Russell moment? He does it in all of his films. He had the same conversation with um, Val Kilmer, uh, Doc Holliday in uh, Tombstone, where at the yeah. end of the movie, you know, Doc Holliday is obviously dying of tuberculosis and he's turned up, and then they just have this nice moment together where Kurt Russell goes, "Thanks for being there, Doc." You know what I mean? Yeah. That's it. You know, you just it, that yeah, word yeah. just means it, a lot. After- <laughs> It's though after Doc Holiday tells him, like, if you've ever had any care in your heart for me, don't ever come back here to see me. Yeah, this is it. You oh. know, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's, <laughs> On this episode, you will hear two grown men cry about cowboys. Um, yeah. And like, like you said, Kurt Russell has those moments in, in movies, but the, like Craig Zoller is smart enough to serve up a number of those to Kurt Russell where mm. he gets to. Like from the opening when David Arquette, like the opening of this oh, movie, yes. of course, yeah. David David yeah. Arquette and said, "Hey, mm. setting off the actions of this movie by knocking over this uh, some stones in a burial ground," mm. and they immediately, like Sid Haig, just gets rocked. Yeah, uh, and David Arquette takes off and and rolls into the town with uh, Kurt Russell at all, uh, where he is the sheriff, and there's that scene where like. You know, Chicory comes to tell him, like, hey, there's this guy at the bar that I saw burying some guns outside of town. And when Kurt Russell goes to interrogate him and David Arquette tries to run, then he just shoots, Kurt Russell shoots just him shoots in him in the foot. Yeah. And which is smart, but also I like the fact that afterwards, everyone, when they're like, oh, yeah, there was this guy in town that the sheriff interrogated, and they're like, oh, did he shoot him in the foot? All right, he shot him in the foot again. All right, let's go, everybody. We got another foot shooting. I, I like that that's just his move. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think this is why this film works so well, is because at the beginning of the movie, and it's great, by the way, to see Sid Haig as a cameo in this, you know, <laughs> it's just brilliant. Oh, and, yeah. And David Arquette as well. I think it's good to see them too. But I think right at the beginning of this movie, the director and the writers and everybody is saying to you, these are the bad guys. This We are revealing them right at the beginning to tell you that if you go into their territory, they are going to kill you. And they're going to kill you quite bad, you know, like by ripping out your spine or whatever it is. A bit like Predator. So immediately you think, oh my God, this is a Western, but you've got these troglodytes that are going to kill you. Then you've got the introduction of the characters of Kurt Russell by him then shooting this David Arquette in the leg saying, if you mess with me, I'm going to shoot you. Do you know what I mean? I am the sheriff in this town. I'm going to sort shit out. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. And then obviously Matthew Fox, as we mentioned. Um, then the Chicory character who's, you know, he, 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 like as I said, he's trying to do the best he, he can, but he comes out with his stories, which is fantastic. Then you've got the love story, haven't you, between Patrick Wilson and his wife. So... I I think the building block is fantastic, which then takes you on to this journey of, you know, cowboys going on, you know, going on a rescue mission. And then you've got all the isolation and everything else, as you mentioned. So it's just, yeah, I find it hard to knock this movie in any sort of way. (laughs) It's like, wow. You know, it's just Uh, very clever. Yeah. I I agree. Yeah, I think the the biggest... (laughs) Oh, no. the, uh, this sounds terrible. The, all right, my my complaint with the movie. It is the single complaint. Oh, I yeah. Actually, two. I have two complaints with the movie. One is I think that Lily Simmons as the wife is not great. Right. I don't think okay. she's terrible, but when when you're surrounded by powerhouses, 
she, like I don't I don't know if it's just the fact that she's just got the lighter voice amongst all these men or something. Maybe I'm just being misogynistic about it. Yeah. But I feel like her performance is like a step below everyone else's in the movie. Right, I see. Yeah, okay. Um, um and I, I this is not really a complaint because n- now that I've seen it more, I think the first time I watched it, I found myself a little uh, antsy to get to the like where are the troglodytes why haven't we seen a troglodyte in a while hmm. um because a big part of the movie is just the, or the first hour hour 10 of the movie is just the journey and uh aside from that that sort of cold open of the film where you actually see the violence and so forth a large part of the next movie or the uh you know, like I said, next hour ten of the movie is just kind of wandering through the desert and, and chit chatting with a, a couple of gunfights here and there to kind of keep things lively. And probably the first time I watched it, I, I sort of bristled at that and thought, I don't know, maybe this this is kind of dull. And on subsequent watches, and especially the most recent watch I had uh, just yesterday, um, I, I don't have that sensation anymore. Maybe it's just the expectation of what the film is and knowing that kind of the point of the movie is is more of these scenes where they're on their way than it is what once they uh they they become captives of, of the troglodyte tribe. Um even though that the stuff that happens in you know that last act of the film is just horrifying and, and unforgettable in many ways and just filled with great moments, but it really is a movie that's sort of about the journey to get to that place. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think uh, the director said that his signature is almost like, um, you know, when you've got the gunpowder and you've got that little trail leading up to the bell. It kind of like just sort of it's igniting, and you're going on that journey. And you just see that little spark, and then it just gets to the bell, and at the end of the movie, it just explodes and just goes boom. Um, a bit like what we get at the end of this film. Uh, I think he's done that in his other films as well, which I'll mention later on. Um, but yeah, no, there is. It, I, I, I think you're right. I don't think this film is for everybody. Um, for that reason, I think I think some of the people viewing this movie could say, "Well, this is this isn't a very entertaining movie." It feels like it's probably takes a long time to actually get to where they're going. So um, some people might say it could do with a, an edit, but. I think the actual point to this film is the. It's, it seems to be more about the characters, doesn't it? Of the journey that they're going on. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. It it is very much a character film because even once we get into the troglodyte cave, um, you know, you still have these moments like uh, Chicory telling the story about the flea circus, hmm. and, <laughs> and, yes, that's and right. well, yeah, it's great. But there's an interesting thing that the movie does. It's just the idea of what separates us from these troglodytes. You know, like there's a lot of talk in the movie about the one thing that people have over the troglodytes is their wits. Mm. You know, like like the troglodytes are a primitive people that they have intellect at, uh, at their disposal. And as soon as they get to the cave, Mrs. O'Dwyer is quick to tell them, you guys are idiots. The problem isn't, uh, she says, the problem with frontier life isn't the Indians, it's the idiots. Yeah. And that's what they're doing, like charging into this cave. She's like, you guys are being stupid, you're going to get everyone killed. Um, that, you know, she's rightfully uh, or, or fortunately not correct about that. But it, it, there's this whole idea of, of belief and what, what kind of makes humans humans. Um, and part of it is like when Kurt Russell is telling the, the young deputy as he's being murdered, yeah. like, Hey, we've got the cavalry on the way and all that. And you know, you're going to be avenged. And Richard Jenkins later, uh, asks him like, well, you know, that's not true. Right. And of course it's not. We, as the audience, we're like, oh, well, damn it, Chicory, you know, as well as we do, there is no cavalry coming, but, uh, you know, but he understands that 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 sort of kindness that's given, and Kurt Russell's I think says, um, "I said that because it's what I'd want to hear." Yeah, okay, and, yeah, that's it. And, yeah. and and so when he when he is then in that position, the first thing Richard Jenkins tells him is, "You're going to be avenged," hmm. which is what you know Kurt Russell told the deputy, and 
And so you recognize that as a lie, but it's a useful one. Yeah. You know, it's a lie of kindness. And then, of course, Kurt Russell just goes Kurt Russell. But, um, you know, it, so so much of the movie is about this idea that, you know, <laughs> whether it's the manifest destiny, the way that uh, Matthew Fox's character uh, performs it with, you know, the Mexicans who show up at camp and just and cuts them down. Or, or it's even the, you know, the rescue attempt itself that it's, it's sort of this noble, foolhardy effort, hmm. you know, um, when they tell her like, Hey, Patrick Wilson, when they're in the cave and, and find Mrs. O'Dwyer and they tell her, Oh, your husband is following us. We left him a trail. And she says, why would you do that? Hmm. Why would you bring more people here? He's gonna come. He's an idiot like you guys. Uh, but of course he comes and saves the day, so eh, stick it, Mrs. O'Dwyer. Yeah, the guy who's in the worst position ends up saving the day as well, doesn't he, with his broken leg. Um, and that's the other yeah, thing. I feel uh, like that's his, his bargain with God a little bit, because there's yeah. that moment where he's, he kind of looks to the heavens and says, I've done a lot of praying over the years, yeah. and this is what it was for. <laughs> so you're either going to help me now or not at all. And, and he kind of gets his divine help. Yeah. And that's the other thing I, I feel with this movie as well is when they actually go out, you look at the characters and you think not everybody seems like they're going to make it, you know, from the start because you've got the old, you know, chicory deputy, uh, Kurt Russell's getting on now a little bit. Um, obviously, Patrick Wilson's got his broken leg. So you're thinking these are the rescuers, but they've all got their flaws and... They're going out to take out these troglodytes, and, you, and oh, there's this sort of sense of, is anybody going to make it to the end of this movie, or are they actually going to rescue this girl? Especially when they actually get to the actual uh, troglodyte cave, or they get to the sort of perimeter of it. And, uh, you know, it's where, obviously, again, spoiler, Matthew Fox gets killed. There's bow and arrows that come down, they get attacked. It looks like Kurt Russell's going to get killed. You're thinking, is anybody going to make this? <laughs> <laughs> There's that sense of dread, which is, again, I think that's that's a good thing in this film. You, as a, as an audience, you're thinking, "Oh my god, is anybody going to make yeah. it?" Yeah, uh, which is very clear. Well, and it, there's a matter of factness. You know, it, we've talked about this being grounded, and that extends to the villains of the movie, who, you know, in from their perspective, they're just you know, revenging the, this insult that was, uh, was done to them when their burial grounds were disturbed. Mm. But you kind of understand the mechanics of this tribe to some extent of, you know, they're these sort of quiet warriors and they're really savage and their breeding practices are terrifying. Yeah. Um, but you also sort of like see that they're, they show curiosity and uh, intellect like you know the the main troglodyte figures out the rifle at one point um and and so they're not they're not as primitive as all that but they're just very much about uh you know that like the the such is the tribe of troglodytes right they're cannibals and that's that's just how they roll they're you know are they horrific sure but you know from their perspective this is just a bunch of people that, you know, fucked up their burial grounds. They went into town after them and got what they felt they deserved as yep. compensation for the insult. And now people are coming after them and trying to kill them, you know? Yeah, it's a bit like uh, the land that time forgot, isn't it? Is the, the troglodytes are from a different place in our history where the human race was like that in the past. So many tens of thousands of years ago, isn't it? It's just that they're somehow caught in today's world from the past and we've stumbled upon it um so yeah it's it's another interesting aspect to look at uh in this movie and yeah i think that's the thing with this film there are as much as it is a slow burn and there's a lot you know of character you know characterization and story and everything there is when you watch this film there's quite a lot you can look into uh which is it's great for a movie that's done on a budget for 1.8 million and a, and a new film director and that, you know, I think there's, there's a lot that's gone into it. Yeah, it, I, 
the budget of the every now and again you'll see sort of the seams of the budget uh, in in some of this. Not often though. It it uses that money real well. Mm. It clearly went on the screen for this film. Uh, I am sure that Kurt Russell in particular took much less than he normally would. He must have done, yeah. Um, yeah. Just, I, I'm sure he read the script and was like, "Oh, I can, I can act the hell out of this thing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna. This is gonna be a real good, uh, a real good movie for me." Um, but yeah, I, you know, there, there's uh, that scene in the in the cave where we see sort of the, um, the carving up of the deputy and oh, so yeah. forth, which is yeah. really, you know, like, just horrifying. And when you get to the moment where that's about to happen to Kurt Russell, you're like. Oh my God! I don't know if I can watch Kurt Russell get eviscerated like this. I'm not well, sure I'm emotionally prepared for it. This in the horror world seems to succeed in shocking people. I think, which is quite rare these days, because we do get a lot of horror movies. And as we've mentioned before, there's a lot of stuff that we see a lot of over and over again. Uh, particularly with the Saw franchise, that took it to another level. I think. Then you get this movie that comes along, and I remember when it came out. I, a friend of mine told me about it and said you should check this film out it's got Kurt Russell on it but then he's <laughs> come out and said there's a horror f- horrific scene in it of a guy getting you know dissected or bisected and yeah. everybody I spoke to was saying oh yeah Bone Tom old man Whoa. you know what I mean and it's wow you know it's for a, you know for a time of where horror is doing really, really, really well at the moment um, this, I thought it reached that peak of, you know, shocking us, I think. <laughs> well, and, and earned it. Like, I, yeah. there is a weirdly similar scene in that movie, Terrifier, that I would argue is completely unearned and is just there to be shocking. Yeah. As opposed to this movie where it is a completely earned scene and when it happens, it's incredibly shocking and incredibly disturbing yeah uh whereas like something like terrifier and i know a lot of people love that movie i'm i'm kind of in the minority that's like that movie kind of sucks mm. but uh, uh when when that bisection scene happens in that movie it's like this is a character i don't really know all that well and i certainly don't care uh, right, and this is just it. yeah you know the this is just violence for the sake of violence this is somebody on the effects team showing off and that's fine but it's just, you know, it it doesn't have the impact and it doesn't land the way that Bone Tomahawk does. Because by the time you get to the point where you're seeing this kind of extreme violence in the film, um, and sometimes it happens quite fast. And I like the fact that there's no music in a lot of those scenes. It's just quiet dudes murdering pe- people yeah. Yeah. And, and people try to defend themselves. Um that it feels not not just grounded, but the stakes are higher because I I don't want Kurt Russell to die. I don't want Patrick Wilson to die. Yeah, I'm a little ambivalent about Matthew Fox, but you know, and I certainly don't want Chickory to die. Like I, these are characters that I really like and, and care about, and so when they're <laughs> placed in mortal danger and yep. shown what can happen to them, then you know that's why the movie works for me and something like you know terrifier doesn't yeah because that's just sort of an exercise in in horror visuals as opposed to an exercise in actual horror which is the idea that people that you care about and love and respect are about to just be treated like meat and it, it's it you know it's the difference in in a successful film to be in an unsuccessful film and, and bone tomahawk has has all of that you know it, it's shocking yes but it's shocking because of how how emotionally invested that you become in this journey exactly yeah with the uh, characters because we want to hear more about chicory's uh flea circus don't we you know when, when you're in a cave Ooh. like that you're thinking yeah tell me more about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and again, it, there are these moments of like human kindness that we don't see from the troglodytes, and I think that's sort yeah. of the one of the underlying messages of the movie is sort of that's the separation is is morals and kindness mm-hmm. is that's kind of civilization. But it, you know, it's when Mrs. O'Dwyer tells Chicory, you know, a lot of flea circuses aren't real, but the one that you went to, they use actual live fleas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, there's that. that there's that look of kind of gratitude that Kurt Russell gives her of like, I pre- appreciate you 
taking taking an unnecessary step just to make my friend feel better. Yeah, in that moment. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's it. Which, is, like you say, separates it from the troglodytes to the the humans or, you know. Um, the other thing I was going to mention as well is the actual um, cinematography of this film as well. There's some really nice shots. Uh, I really like the scene when they go out on the horses and they ride out. I thought that was very, you know, uh, you know it's that sort of typical type western scene when, when our heroes ride out uh, the, the movie had a real sort of vibe to it um, again I mentioned earlier the, the isolation um, and the music comes in just just at the right moments as you said um, so yeah there's there's the, there's other things that complement this movie to, to, to make it go along which I, I really liked yeah it like I said, uh, aside from a couple of minor quibbles, yeah, um, it's just it, it's a really strong film. It, it, it's a movie that I like. You know, as we discussed, I don't know that I would recommend it to everyone. No, because no. it's it is very very slowly paced at times. If you're not if you're not kind of into those character moment scenes, uh, you're gonna find yourself checking your watch. Um, and and the other end of that spectrum is if you have a weak constitution, the end of this movie is going to uh, challenge your delicate sensibilities. Um, but if you happen to like Westerns and are not put off by uh, long stretches of character conversation and sp sporadic bits of incredibly savage violence, um, you know, th there's almost that Tarantino sort of vibe to it all of, we're going to spend all these time with characters and then all of a sudden one of them's just going to get murdered horribly in, yeah. before our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That Matthew Fox death. The, 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 I wish more movies did this, but I'm also glad that nobody is ripping off uh, bone tomahawk all the time, but it's the, the scene where uh, Matthew Fox's hand gets cut off. Yeah. But when he, when he pulls back his arm and the hand stays, <laughs> That's it's it's really well done. Yeah. It's a great effect, yeah. and also the look of horror on Matthew Fox's face of like, oh my god, my hand is gone. <laughs> it's it's yeah. chilling. It's like there are a couple of moments in this movie where you see a, a character come face to face with a moment where they know that they're gonna die, yeah. and it's I, I'm maybe it's just because I'm older now. I'm fascinated so much by that moment in films when you see uh, someone be like, okay, well, this is it. Okay, how are we going to go out? How are we going to do this? What, it, what are my last moments? Yeah. And, and of course, for Kurt Russell, it's three final shots that we hear from the cave to let us know that in his dying breath, Kurt Russell has ended the troglodyte scourge. Or, or we hope, you know, I mean, they say there could be more, but we all we know for sure that were that there were three left. Yeah. And, it's... And we hear three shots. As you said, I think it's just got a lot of conviction about it, hasn't it? In, in those moments there, like you say, with the death scenes and that, with Matthew Fox's death, he's got sweat coming down his brow, and he looks like he's just about to die. Um, yeah. So yeah, and it uh, ends uh, with uh, with Chicory tossing a stone into the earth. Like the final shot is is that that rock hitting the earth, which is sort of the bookend because it all starts because of some rocks getting knocked over. Like yeah. that's the thing that yeah. the movie reminds you is like, Oh, all of this violence is completely needless. Yeah. That's but, it. Like any film, isn't it? Something that happens at the beginning kind of happens at the end, isn't it? And I like the, as you said, I like the way that book ends, uh, which is great. So yeah, that is, that's is bone Tom. I think we've probably discussed everything we need to talk about with that. Haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so good. Like, I wish I just had the script in front of me so I could point out all the great dialogue in it. But it is just chock full of, uh, like I said, it's just a Western, Old West idioms and slang. And the more of that you put in your movie, the happier I am. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned um, Tarantino because I picked up on that. And I think with the Chicory character, that is Tarantino. Like it reminded me of Pulp Fiction with Samuel Jackson and um, oh, what's his name? John Travolta. Travolta. Yeah. So when they're going on the, they're about to do a job, but then they're talking about you know cheeseburgers, you know, and 
you know, what do you call a you know cheeseburger in, in France? Oh, it's a Royale with cheese. Do you know, it's it's completely off the subject to what they're doing. They're about to go and kill someone, but they are talking about cheeseburgers, and I think that's the same with this film. It's Chicory saying, "Let's talk about a flea circus whilst we're in this cave." You know, like, so there's that's the elements for me. It's just sort of something's happening, but we're going to go just off a tangent to yeah. maybe lighten yeah. the mood, well, mood it, or something. You know? It, it, I, I find that to be very human because yes, one of the weird things yeah. about mortal situations is that if you're stuck in a situation like that where death is imminent, um, you know, like if you've ever had a parent die or something, like it, you, you kind of know this moment where death is coming yep. and everything is serious, yep. but also you have to fill the time with something. And you end up talking about dumb shit. Yes. yes Even though there's yeah. this heavy thing about yeah. to happen, but yeah. you're having these conversations about, you know, books you read or movies you saw or something while this other thing is hovering over you. Yeah. And uh, it's, oh, it's so well done. It's, it very, was, it's very clever. It was like the film I watched um, based on a true story about the soldiers out in Afghanistan. It's called Gajaki. And they get blown up by Russian landmines. And in one of, in that movie, one of them gets blown up, and he's still alive. And he's basically shot to shit. He's talking. He's saying to his mate, he says, "If I don't make this, he goes, tell tell your mum that I love her." You know, it's like yeah. even in that situation, he's come out and just come out with a bit of humour. Do you know what I mean? Because I guess it's his mind trying to sort of think of something that's going to give him some comfort. So. Um, and I think that's a big part of this film with um, certain scenes, you know, as we've, as we've mentioned. So, yeah, it's clever. It's clever writing. It's different. Um, the other thing I was going to mention as well, I think it's quite important because this is um, pretty much a, an independent movie. I was going to mention RLJ Entertainment that did home videos back in the 80s. And they helped with the funding of this. Um, so they were like the distributor. And they did other films like uh, Mandy... VFW, Colour Out Space. My name is Bruce and Sleepwalkers back in the day. So I thought that's worth a mention as well. So it's good to see that um, there's funding from uh, these distributors to try and get films like this produced, which is good, you know, for the industry. Yeah. I'm real curious if perhaps Kurt Russell signed on to this based yeah. on the script mm -hmm. and that's what got the movie made. Yeah. Is like, oh, we're going to make this horror western, and by the way, Kurt Russell is is the cowboy. Um, I I have a suspicion that's probably how it happened. Yeah, I, I imagine that he uh, probably had something, you know, a bit, yeah, in Hollywood. So I imagine he probably had a big shout on that. Um, so yeah, yeah I may and that and, and that's why you get people like you know, I in again, this is all just total fan fiction, but in a world where. Hey, you know, S. Craig Zoller gets uh, Kurt Russell to sign on to his movie. That's why you get a Richard Jenkins to sign on, and, yeah. and, and you know, and a Matthew Fox, and you know, all that. It's you, you know, you you establish your tentpole talent of the movie, and let everybody be like, oh, I absolutely want to be in a western with Kurt Russell. Yes, please. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the. I, I, I'd imagine that's going to draw some attention, isn't it? You know, Kurt Russell is in a I, Western. Oh, yeah, I want to be in that film as well. Yeah, definitely. No kidding. I mean, what I wouldn't give to be somebody that Kurt Russell shot in a movie, as long as I get a couple of lines from him, like, you know, <laughs> run, you cur, and then shoot me or something, I'm totally fine with that. I would love that. <laughs> oh, quite I would just have it play on a loop on my tombstone. It was a... Uh, um... I did notice it was uh, the James Tocan, the Mr. Strickland from Back to the Future. He's the guy at the piano. Even he turns up for a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's a great gag there. Of it's uh, it's three cents for a song or three songs for a dime. Mm, yeah. Which, if you do the math, is more. And Matthew Fox questions him about it, and he's just like, "Those are the rates." And he's like, "All right, well, there's a dime." And then he flips over the sign. And it says one shot to start. So you get the dime and then get somebody to buy you a drink just to start playing. I, that's a good scam. Yeah. As far as uh, saloon-based scams go, that's a pretty good one. So you've got nice little touches like that in this film. So it's great. Um, so, yeah, I'll be interested to see. I know we've had a couple of other movies from uh, Salah. 
the uh, director. We had Brawl in Cell Block 99, which I enjoyed. Similar sort of um, signature. Kind of like a slow burn, then it gets a bit brutal at the end. Um, I don't know what you thought of his other movies, Bo. Yeah, I, I think... I think I probably like this the best just because it's more in my wheelhouse. Yeah. But something like Brawl in Cell Block 99 is really fun because Vince Vaughn kind of stretches in that movie and it is a little bit on Vince Vaughn. Yeah. Uh, and and that's a fun... And, and I think you're right. I think he has this sort of signature of he is a guy who likes to, uh, as you put it... Uh, you know, sort of light the fuse and to put the camera on the fuse as it heads towards its inevitable conclusion. Um, but I think he's a really talented director. Like I said, this is, is my favorite from him, but all of his movies are at least good. You know, I don't think he's made a bad movie yet. Dragged Across Concrete maybe comes the closest, but I would say that movie is <laughs> merely above average. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dragged Across Concrete for me, I'll probably need to give it a bit of time. Um, I think I know what he was trying to do with that film, but it's probably my least favourite so far. But I, I do appreciate directors trying to give us something different, to try and push the boundaries. Because I'm a, I'm a Shalaman fan. Um, yeah. Apart from the Last Airbender, I'm sorry, Shalaman, but <laughs> that was probably him just sitting in the big studios. But um, Shalaman works his best. I, funny enough. It's the same with Carpenter. These directors seem to work their best when they're working with a smaller bu- budget. It's 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 a funny thing in filmmaking, you know. Well, it's just yeah, it's the it is. the mother of invention, right? Like yeah. it, it, I, we can't afford to do this thing that we really want to do. So how do we get across the same idea? Yeah, it's um, and and you know, and for directors and and a you know cast and crew kind of working on all cylinders, that's a real opportunity to to do something different or interesting or you know whatever, but. Uh, and, and like you said, I, you know, dragged across concrete doesn't, doesn't hit every, uh, every target for me, but I'd still rather see that than like Harry Potter seven or whatever. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. Um, yeah, I've said this before. I've, I've said this to Dan Bone many a times, you know, we've had these conversations. I've been to see films that have been made for like $200 million and I've come out and I've just couldn't remember anything that was going on in it you know and then i watch a film like bone tom walk and i'm just like yeah i know everything about this film you know and i'm talking about it so it's, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah you it's, could make literally make a hundred bone tomahawks for what one of one of those pirates of the caribbean movies cost. yeah exactly yeah this is it. you know yeah so that's crazy we could have a hundred more bone tomahawks. Stop making those. <laughs> stop making those Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Give all those all that money to new directors. Um, yeah, it, uh. it. But it's always exciting too when you see a movie like this. I, I'm always energized and innervated as a movie fan when a movie comes along that becomes one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Uh, like when The Witch came out, and I was like, "Oh, this is one of the best horror movies I've ever seen," and th- I, I'm just now seeing it. Yeah, um, and it's it's one of the the things that I think being passionate about movies is is really like s- fulfilling and and sort of uh, self sustaining in a lot of ways because they're always making them, and if you if you care to look, they're always making good ones and like every few years one will pop up and bone tomahawk i think is kind of in that number of movies i'm like oh this is a movie i will never forget and i will i will talk about in some form until i'm just no longer able to to do so yeah like Uh, we have today because believe me i i'm not like this with every film um you know for the show i am of course i'm going to be biased because i'll pick the films i want to review um but yeah this film i can talk a lot about but as you said there's some two hundred million dollar films that I'm just not interested in. You know, I'm talking. I won't name and shame, but there's some big hitters out there. But I've just walked out of the cinema and I've gone, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you know, you know, we've got. I have got my five bucks worth or ten bucks, whichever cinema you go to. But I'm not going to talk about this film, or it hasn't done anything for me at all. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, that's the worst feeling in the world to me. Yeah. Like, I don't mind really hating a movie. I don't like to talk about movies I hate that much because mm. I, you know, I try to be positive and yeah, so forth. Yeah, me too, yeah. Uh, but 
you know, I don't mind having that kind of reaction to a movie where I leave it and I'm like, oh, that thing was just a total piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, the worst feeling in the world is just complete neutrality with the film. Mm. Like, I, I, it's fine, I guess. You know, it was it was a dark, cool theater, and and scenes flickered in front of my eyes for two hours, but that's it. Yeah. I mean, and like you said, for the kinds of money that they're they're yeah. spending for those kinds of films, you just like it ought to knock the eyeballs to the back of your skull. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's probably it's, what, it's sad. That's probably what annoys me the most with that. But there you go. But there you go. We're not not gonna love every movie, but um, yeah, no, it's um. It's great talking to you today, Bo, again. Uh, about yeah, Bone my Tom pleasure. Was... I get up early to do these with you, and that's always fun because I'm like, okay, but like we start these about 6 a.m. my time, <laughs> and so it's literally the first thing I do in the day is make coffee and then talk about a movie, which is amazing. Well, hopefully I've energized you for the rest of the day. <laughs> Give me that oh, boost. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go fight a bear after this. I'm excited. <laughs> Find oh. a troglodyte of my own. Make sure you post that on Legion, will you? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you. I, one of my one of the things I love so much is when somebody will just tag me in any story about a bear. Yeah, where they're like, "Oh, Bo will love this," and I, it does my heart good that there is enough of uh, like somewhere in the back of people's minds when they hear the word like bear attack. Yeah, that they just immediately go to me, and. <laughs> That that feels good. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> oh dear, well you go careful out there with the bears. Um so before we end the show, Bo, what have you got coming up? I know you've like I say you got we mentioned earlier you got your, your new show with Jamie. Um sit, pick six movies. I did <laughs> yeah. actually listen to the swarm episode you did the other day. <laughs> With, with our bad Michael Caine impressions, yeah, yeah, uh, um, it, yeah, that was a lot of fun to do. Uh, talking like Michael Caine even badly is a good time. Yeah, I think he definitely took the paycheck for that one. But I, I do remember what the last time I watched that one was when I was probably about twelve years old. That's um, as I've mentioned before, the seventies, the eighties, earthquake swarms, alligators in the sewer. I think you was pretty much fucked wherever you went. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, like that whole period was just about no matter where you are, there is something to eat you there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the the swarm is, is kind of nonsense. Actually, as we record this, uh, as soon as we wrap up, I'm going to be dropping the episode on Anaconda for Pick Six Movies right. uh, as we continue our tour through uh, the, the our, this season. So, all right, let me take a step back. Pick Six Movies. What we do is we uh, we pick six movies, as the title suggests, built around a common theme. This season, that theme is it's like Jaws, which are a bunch of movies that are like Jaws. Yeah. And so we've been going through all these animal attack movies, and it, it is absolutely my wheelhouse. Uh, yeah. When when Chad pitched the season, he was like, I'm just letting you know, this is for you. This yeah. is for you having to do all the James Bond movies. Now, <laughs> now that you have suffered through all of those uh, are the ones that we covered, then now I get to, you know, feast on... Uh, all these animal attack movies, but yeah, that that we're coming up on our hundredth episode of that oh, show. Oh wow! Okay, uh, which is crazy. Wow. Um, so yeah, we we pick six movies, but you know, it's it, you can listen to any of those out of order. To, if you see a movie that you you think would be fun to hear us talk about, uh, jump in, and and I I think that show uh, comes out pretty well most of the time. Yeah, no, I love it. I love the uh, concept of what you're doing there. Um, just want to mention, we've got a little bit of sad news, which I just wanted to bring up on the show. One of our fellow Legion podcast brothers has sadly passed away, so I just wanted to um, just talk about that for a little bit, just as a sort of commemoration for uh, Johnny Johnny Krug, who sadly passed away, um, which obviously I know, I know you know about. We discussed this before the uh, show, Bo, um, but we're going to try and put something together on Legion. Yeah, you know, it, it's we're still in in the planning stages of, of sort of how we want to address this, but I, I think we're on our way to to doing something. I think is going to be real positive. Um, yeah, it was it was a particular sadness for me mm. because leading up to his death, we had been talking uh, regularly about bringing his show back and had. Uh, had it ready to go. Like we were, we were at the point where, you know, we were kind of waiting on him to, 
uh, start turning in episodes. And um, he was really enthusiastic about it. And we, we were both excited and, yeah. and um, uh, yeah, so it, it's really, that that's the thing that I think hurts the most yeah. is he was one of the best solo podcasters I think I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. And I like my hats off to you for this reason as well. I don't do it that often because, uh, it's an, it's scary, but to just sit down and talk into a mic mm -hmm. with no one else to, to be a safety net for you or to bounce things off of, or to fill the silence or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's difficult yeah. as you well know, mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you do an amazing job oh, at it. You. And uh, but Johnny was one of the, the the first I heard do that in a way that I was like, oh, he doesn't need a co-host. Like, it, that would almost uh, damage the show. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so I wish that I could hear the shows he would do now. You know, being yeah. a little bit older and a yeah. little bit wiser. And, um, and, and so that's the part of it that I find most heartbreaking. And of course, you know, the, the, the family that's left behind and, and what that, that kind of, you know, crippling emotional blow can, can do. But, uh, as you said, we are trying to figure out, uh, how best to not only honor his memory, but potentially help out the family if, if possible, or if needed, uh, they may not need our help at all. In which case we'll just do uh, a big dumb show in honor of Johnny. Um, but yeah, so that, you know, by all means kind of follow us on Facebook at Legion podcasts, uh, as well as Instagram and Twitter. Um, and information will be forthcoming on kind of when and where, uh, you can find that tribute. But more than anything, I just encourage you to go back, uh, where you can find it. Um, we were in the process of like getting some of his shows moved over and it never really materialized. So I, another regret of mine is that I'm not able to just say, go to this page and you can hear everything. Yeah. Um, but if you can find the, the crew grenation stuff, uh, you should, you should listen to it. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think the other lesson to, to, to kind of <laughs> broaden it a little bit is, uh, that if you are a person who suffers from depression or mental illness of any kind, um, you know, like, please don't, don't think that your struggle is someone else's burden. Yeah. You know, like people want to help. And, and, and the thing that I think all of us are left with in, in Johnny's passing is this notion of, could I have done something different or more? Uh, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, getting getting older and wiser myself, uh, I don't I don't think there is a single thing that any any person could have done to to sort of prevent Johnny's fate, other than Johnny himself. Um, and and that's not to say he he was responsible or anything. It's just a disease. It's a, a depression and mental illness. It's a terrible, insidious fucking disease. Uh, it 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 robs it robs the, the victim of the disease from the life that they deserve to lead. And it robs all the rest of us of that person. Yeah. too. And, uh, so if, you know, please, if, if you are someone who ever in, in a moment of the day, thinks to yourself, uh, that you are, you are not of worth or value, uh, or, or can't get a handle on, on some emotions that seem to overwhelm you, uh, get some help. Let your let your friends and family know, and they're not they're not going to be burdened. They're not going to be angry. They're not gonna they're not gonna think less of you. Uh, they are going to hopefully be there to to get the help that we all need. Sometimes I've been in therapy for like six years. Um, it, it it's something it's a a subject that's near and dear to my heart because you know it's sort of a there but for the grace of God for me where I'm like if if I hadn't gotten help from the right people at the right time, I don't, I don't know where I would be. Yeah. And, um, it, and it's good to hear these stories as well. And I think we're hearing these stories more from people from different backgrounds and more people are coming forward now, which is a breakthrough, I think. And it's, uh, as you just said, it's, it's not, it's not a bad thing to say, look, I'm struggling no matter what background you come from, you know? And, um, yeah, I, I think that is, 
reaching out more now uh, as a voice. Um, but what I will say about Johnny as a legacy, um, he inspired me to do what I do. You know, as you know, I looked at Kruger Nation. I thought, oh, he's doing podcasting solo. Maybe I can do it. Um, then I listened to him on Ricky Morgan's Short Bus Cinema episode, and got to tell you, you know, he, him and Ricky entertained me on some, you know, trips into London on a commute. And he was very awe-inspiring with his voice. You know, he had a, you know, with him, him and Ricky talking about those, you know, god awful movies. But his his laughter and his cheer and his enthusiasm inspired me. So. Um, he I always say there's there's a quote. It's like it, no one's forgotten if you're still talking about them, and Johnny won't be. So you know, it's what I like to say. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I right. I, I'm it. a big believer in the the idea of, of you die two deaths: the the first when you die, and the second when no one says your name again. Yeah. And uh, while while Johnny unfortunately uh, experienced that first death, it's going to be a good long while. Yeah. Uh, before the second, so it is. Uh, but like you said, the, the way that the community has kind of come together and particularly, you know, everybody here at Legion and, and the first response everyone had was, what can we do to help? Yeah. And and it's why it's why I love all of you guys. It's why I love the listeners. It's why I love the, the host. Um, you know, it, like we rally around like we, we circle the wagons and, and make sure that everybody's OK yeah. uh, when when these things happen. And and. I, it's the thing I'm proudest of, you know, like I love all the podcasts and all the shows and, and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, uh, it's all humans. That's what it comes down to is it's just people. And the fact that we are part of a group of people that the first instinct in a situation like this isn't to ignore it or run away or to wallow in it. It is how, do, how do we do something to make this better? How do, how do we help? Yeah. Uh, and it, it, Oh my God! It it warms my my grinchety heart so much. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's you know it, it's a tragedy, but also in in the midst of that tragedy, you you can hopefully there is good to be mined from it in some way, and and that like you said that people just saying like oh here's the struggle I had with mental illness or here's here's how I dealt with depression uh, at this point in my life and. Uh, or ongoing or whatever it is. Uh, you know, I've had discussions with some podcasters recently in our group that, you know, were like, this was a thing, it, this on top of this other thing that I experienced led to this sort of emotional catharsis. And, mm. uh, uh, it's, you know, it, I, it's, I hesitate to say like there, there is good to be had from it because it seems so, so grim, but there, there's such positivity within our community yeah. that uh it, it's made it so much more bearable yeah um so i'm i'm eternally grateful I, I i walk around all day thinking i'm i'm really lucky to work with the people that i do yeah yeah and i think that's it and i think that's the, the reaction is is that yeah how i how i would expect it to be god you know i don't, I don't want this to happen but I knew this group of guys would react to something like this in you know any sort of shape or form. And that's why I'm here. So very proud of that, and I think we should be very very proud as a as a Legion podcast and community, and for all of our our listeners. And what I will say is, mm -hmm. if there is anybody struggling out struggling out there, you know, private message us, all of us. You know, I've heard um, oh. Gavin and Dan mention it on their <laughs> show. They 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 went into it in quite a broad aspect. Uh, Gav Chucky still was quite open about it. I know he won't mind me mentioning that because he mentioned it on his show, so I, I, I totally appreciate that. So, uh, yes, please, you know, contact us. We're here to listen as much as we are here to entertain everybody, you know, so it's, yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. You, If you want to slide into our DMs at Legion Podcast over on Twitter, um, even if it's just to say, like, hey, here's the struggle. Like, if you just need to get some off your chest, feel free to send it that way, but especially if you're somebody that's like, hey, I'm struggling, I'm not sure what my next step is. As someone who has uh, navigated <laughs> the, yeah. the waters of finding uh, the right therapist and, and the right kind of help, um, I am more than happy to, to help anyone try to get to a place where they can live a better and longer and more fulfilling life. Uh, I... I'm I am at a place now where I'm like a, a happy uh, like individual that can both give and receive love yeah. thanks to 
uh, thanks to psychotherapy. So oh, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm living proof that there is there is a, a success story out there. Well, thank you very much, Bo. Um, well, I really appreciate you coming on to the show today. I'm glad, I'm glad we spoke about that at the end as well. Um, so, guys, I um, hope you enjoyed the episodes. Um, just for a little bit of admin for the show, I, as you know, I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Um, I've also got another show called uh, The Mystery Vault Podcast, where I talk about uh, mysteries and the unexplained, if you want to have a listen to that. You can listen yeah, to... Yeah, Diot Love, baby. That episode was great. I, like, <laughs> I, like a, I love Diot Love Fair stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was... That, honestly, Bo, that took me down a big rabbit hole. Um, I, I had to delay that episode as well, because I just had to really think about how I was going to produce that show because it took me down loads of different different avenues. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that was good. That yeah. was a great one. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, I've got another episode coming out for um, Bite Size. Should be coming, hopefully, in the next few weeks, which is uh, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels with uh, Mark Lockhart. Um, I'll also chuck in a few solo shows there in, in between that as well. Um, you can listen to uh, Bite Size and The Mystery Vault on, if you put into Google, um, it will take you to a service on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's also on YouTube. Um, I've got a Facebook page where I'm most active on both of those shows, so you put some comments on there and tell me what you've been watching or what you'd like me to have a look at, if there's any films that you want me to have a review of. Um, and that is it guys, so uh, as always, keep it Bite Size. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.